Strengthening Families Act, signed into law in 2014, requires state agencies to report a missing child to both law enforcement and to NICMIC within 24 hours of receiving information about a missing child under their care. NICMIC was designated by Congress to serve as the national clearinghouse on issues relating to missing and exploited children. NICMIC is funded partially by a mandatory federal grant from the Department of Justice and serves as a reporting and case management center for issues related to the prevention of and recovery from child victimization. Our investigation continues today with a third public hearing. We will hear from and about children subjected to the worst forms of abuse, including sex trafficking, exploitation, and sexual abuse. This is an investigation about children, the most vulnerable children in the nation. The investigation is active and ongoing, and I believe it can and must spur the long overdue reform that these children deserve. First, we will hear from Tiffany, a young woman from Georgia who will testify today about her experience within the Georgia foster care system. And after Tiffany, we will have an opportunity to hear directly from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children on their findings, as well as further experts on the challenges and risks facing foster children here in Georgia. I'll now introduce Tiffany, and Tiffany, thank you again for joining us today. Tiffany McLean Camp will be our witness on our first panel. And Tiffany, if you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Let the record note that the witness answered in the affirmative. Tiffany, please take your seat. I'll ask your colleague to ensure that your uh, microphone is enabled with the red light showing. And uh, whenever you're ready, Tiffany, with gratitude from the subcommittee for your courage in coming forward and speaking with us today, you may offer your opening statement. Thank you. My name is Tiffany McLean Camp. I'm 19 years old. I first entered foster care in Georgia when I was 15, but that's not where my story begins. I was born in Detroit and removed from my biological mother when I was two years old. At the age of three, I was adopted. From the age of three until I was 15, I was physically abused and neglected by my adopted parent and sexually abused by a family friend. My adopted parents were involved in 23 Child Protective Services reports. While living in Michigan, at one point I was removed from my adopted parents and placed in foster care. We had moved to Georgia in 2019, but, that, but the abuse did not end there. One day I told a teacher that I was afraid to go home and they called defects. A case manager came out to our home and asked me a question right in front of my parents. I was afraid I would get in trouble, so I said everything was okay. When no one protected me, I tried to protect myself. I tried to run away and try to fight back. Anything I could to escape. I was arrested for trying to protect myself from my father's abuse. He was never arrested, and Defect said that I was the problem. No one listened to me. No one believed me. When I was put in foster care, defense didn't believe that I had been abused or neglected, even after I told them. To them, I was unruly, a runaway, and a behavior problem. I was in defense custody until I was 18. While in defense custody, I experienced abuse, medical neglect, educational neglect, and was even sexually assaulted in traffic. I moved placements more than 20 times. I was put in group homes, detention centers, and foster homes, like Monet. I was in, I was at death row for nearly eight months. I was there. I don't remember my case manager coming to see me once in person. Like Monet, I remember the barbed wire fence, 
being over medicated, but put in isolation. I remember staff forcing my pants down and forcing me to get a shot on my bottom and then feeling drowsy. They treated me like I wasn't human. I was placed in a few different group homes that were supposed to be safe house for girls who was trafficked. At one of these placements, I witnessed a staff fighting with the other girls at home, staff smoking marijuana and not being allowed to go to school in person, not for my protection, but to protect group homes and staff other children. Staff will call me and the other girls the B word one time. I even heard the staff call other girls in the home a slut. When I was 18, I signed myself out of care, but then find out I was pregnant. I called my case manager to tell her to get what I needed to prepare myself for motherhood. For example, the effects still had my social security card and birth certificate. I needed information about transportation. My son was born premature and was in the NICU for three weeks. Foster care left me without housing without housing or, in, or assistance. I needed to take care of myself and my child. I wanted a better life for my son, so I called Defects and signed back into care. Defects couldn't find a placement for us. So my son and I had to spend the first six weeks of his life in the emergency shelter. Then I was placed in a group home for teen moms. A staff member falsely accused me for neglecting my son, and Defects took him from me for a month. The court ordered defects to find a placement for me and my son to be together. And if they couldn't find somewhere for us, that I get to see him three times a week. But I didn't get to see him three times a week. And we weren't placed together. For a month, three bonds was broken. The bond between the mother and the child. The bond we were building for the first three months of his life while I was breastfeeding. The bond created through skin-to-skin -skin and other interactions important for his development. Instead, defects tried to force me to sign myself out of foster care and kept me and my child apart. After one month of being apart, my son returned to me. The court found that defects did not have any evidence that I was abusing or neglecting my son. During all of this, Defects was neglecting me since I signed myself back into care. I had been asking for therapy to help, my, help me with the past and trauma and postpartum depression. I asked to see a doctor for infections I had related to past abuse in my pregnancy. I had an infection caused by pieces of leftover placenta. I didn't see an OBGYN until more than six months after giving birth to my son. Despite how defects has treated me, I'm still here because I have to focus on what is best for my son. I'm working on getting my GED and planning on going to nursing school. Because I have an attorney in CASA who will fight for me and listen to me and believe me. My son and I are now living in a foster home where we feel safe and supported. I have a new case manager who listened to me and asked me what I need for the first time since I was 15. I hope. I have hope. A hope through my testimony of the children won't have to go through it, through what I went through. Thank you. Tiffany, thank you for sharing your story with us. No child should have to go through the experiences that you've survived. And I know it must be painful to revisit and to relive these things, but the public and the Senate are grateful to you for having the courage to speak out. You testified that you were trafficked while in DFAC's care. And trafficking while in foster care represents one of the worst ways that the state can fail a young person. I also understand that there is or will be a criminal case against those who attacked you. So I'm not going to ask you to talk about that experience in more detail, given the other ongoing legal matter. But I do want to ask you some questions 
to understand your experiences in foster care. You testified that when you moved to Georgia, you tried to report abuse in your home to a teacher. But when DFAX interviewed you, they did so right in front of your parents. Did you feel like you could tell DFAX about the abuse you were experiencing in that setting? Honestly, no. I feel like I couldn't tell them because it was my parents that I that they invited me in front of, and then I that my siblings was there. So it's like I, I couldn't explain or show how I really felt inside because I felt like if I did, I was gonna be whole responsibility from my parents of like anger and in hatred towards me or they would look at me a different way for me you know reporting them well i try to like tell them it's okay or i'm okay i'm um get through it I'm, I'm fine and i just remember my case manager was like well you can say what you have to say but it's, i was like no it's okay and i kept saying it was okay because i didn't want to get in trouble by my parents so i try to hide everything with, no, I'm okay, I'm, and try to change the subject to like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this in school, I'm working on a project. So I kind of hide all that dark moments inside because I didn't want to deal with the consequences with my parents. And Tiffany, I can hear you fine. I want to make sure that everybody can. Ma'am, if you wouldn't mind perhaps just moving the microphone a little bit closer to Tiffany, I'd be grateful to you. Uh, Tiffany, I can only imagine, again, how challenging it is to speak publicly about these things. And so if at any time you need a break, you just let me know. We're all grateful to you for speaking today. You testified that when you did eventually enter foster care, you had 20 placements. Yes. What was it like to move around so often? To move around so often, it was scary especially because they was all in diff located in different areas that I've never been to. So it was like, it was scary. And then being in different settings with other youths that have been through what I went through, and then dealing with staff, it was hard because you had staff that was rude to the girls, judging them, making us, like, make them feel like they wasn't worth being, you know, being part of this world, like, you had staff like, oh, why, why are you wearing that? That's not cute. Or why you do your hair like that? Or, oh, you think that perfume smells good on you? And it's like, I feel like that wasn't appropriate because it's like everybody should feel comfortable in their skin. And it was a group home where they didn't even let us go to school. So it's like, how are we supposed to learn when we're locked down 24 seven. You really even, you, you don't go outside, you just trapped. So it's like, how are we supposed to learn any type of life skill or education skills or just different activities in the community when you have no, no skill or you don't have no mindset to even do anything when you're not taught from the mind skills or life skills. You don't, you don't have that, that type of skill because imagine being in a group home with six to 10 girls and we're like, you know, what are we supposed to do? Like, are we learning anything today? Or can we go outside? And I say, I'm like, oh no, you can't go outside. You can't do this. So it's like, well, what is there to do? And when I asked about more towards going to school, I was like, why are we not going to school? Oh, we're just trying to protect you guys from going out to the community and interacting with their kids. So I didn't really understand what she meant by that. So I was like, what do you mean about like protecting us from like other kids? It was a cover up as in staff was doing things they shouldn't have been doing in the group home. So they really was trying to protect themselves from us telling like other kids or teachers, even if we went to school to not to say anything. 
So they would punish us as, oh, you, you have to do school inside the group home, but we was barely even doing schooling inside the group home. So it was a lack of education to even learn any type of skills. Like you had some youth, even including me, like, how are we supposed to learn how to do math when we don't know no skills? How are we supposed to learn how to read? How are we supposed to do anything? Because your education is going to take you so far in life. It's going to get you where you need to be. So it's like, if this is supposed to be a setting for young females, and then I'm just that, the staff, y'all are women too. So like, help us help each other to get better. And it wasn't no support or care in it. It was like, well, we're the staff, y'all locked down, y'all can't do what y'all want to do, y'all can watch TV, and that's it. So it, it felt like being in prison, like, like we're in a jail cell, but you just been locked down forever, and it's like, when I, when I, when I'm going to get out? It was like you had other young ladies, and including me, want to run away from the problem because it's like, why, why be stuck? And why be stuck when I can just run? But even when trying to run away, they punish you for that too. But I, I just never got the understanding of like, why are we being treated like that when we we all come from different backgrounds, we all come from different traumas. It was like, where where's that that therapy? Support, where is that caring, love, and support? Where is just, this is any type of support. Where is just, there's, there's, where is there's any type of, kin 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 uh, sorry, <laughs> any communication skills? Where, where is it? And I just feel like, it made me feel like I was a human. It just feel, it made me feel like an animal that's locked up in a cage. You testified about your experience at Devereaux. Yes. What was Devereaux like? It was like jail. Yeah. I remember the first time I came there, it was around June. And you just see a gate and bob wires. And I'm like, what is this place? They was like, this is your new group home. And I'm like, this don't look like a group home. This is like jail. He was like, no, it's not jail. It's, it's friendly here. You're going to like it. So... The two first months that I have been there, I'm like, this is not okay. You have staff abusing young men and, and, and young females. You have staff body slamming them, choking them, injecting them with medication, over drugging them. And it's like, this is what we came here to be treated for. And it, it just feels horrible. I feel like a, a horror movie that you just stuck and like you can't never get out of it and you have kids that been there two, for two years in dealing with that you have kids that been there for four five years and it's like that time that they've been here for years what are you guys doing to help them what are you guys doing to better them and it's like you just see kids crying begging to go home or can can i talk to my caseworker can i talk to somebody i i, I want to leave and it's like oh well you're not going to leave you're not going to see your your family your friends you're, you're you're here to get treatment but it's like how are we here to get treatment if you're abusing us and just drugging us that's not the right treatment i feel like as in the youth of a group home the treatment that we needed was love and care in in the support system and it should have been more support because they they will try to say, well, you know, sometimes you guys put your your own selves in situations that you shouldn't have put yourself in situation. But it's like no child asked to be put in care to be neglected. And I feel like there's no such thing as a behavior child or 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 a bad or a terrible child because. Well, if it it came down to it, it's a lot of kids. I'm not going to say kids, a lot of youth that's been in care. It's over a thousand of us in care. And for all these cases to been looked at as neglect, abuse, you have kids that, that 
went through trauma, the where they're not eating, being trafficked, being abused, have no support system, then being in a group home setting, if you know these backgrounds with these youths, why not help them if that's your job to help us get better? You're saying that, oh, I, I'm, I'm working here because I love children. I want to help you guys get better. You can't say you love and you want to help somebody when you're, you're, you're abusing them. Do you remember, Tiffany, your defects caseworker coming to visit you while you were at Devereux? No. I never... The whole entire time I've been there, I've been there for half a year. I have no received no phone calls from my case manager, no visit. Um, the only phone call I've been getting was like maybe from like family members and maybe a friend. But besides the case manager, I I never had that support from her. And it's like all this time I'm like I'm in care. And you're supposed to be my case manager. You know, you're supposed to help me with my needs. Whether it's emotional needs, physical needs, mentally. It is. It was no support with her. And it made me feel like less of, of human because it's like, I've been through so much. And you're not even realizing that this the trauma and, and everything I went through from... The age of three to fifteen, even now, you you never you never helped me get better. You never helped me get past of the things that I need to get past. You have a baby boy, right? Yes. I have a, a two year old daughter. How old is your son now? My son is eight months and a half. Eight months and a half. You described how you left foster care at age eighteen, but you signed back in or extended services after having your son. Right. That it took six weeks for DFAX to find a placement for you. And that while you waited, you were living in an emergency shelter with your baby. Did I understand you correctly? Yes. What was it like being in an emergency shelter with a newborn baby? Um, Take your time, Tiffany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I had so many thoughts and worries about being in that shelter. My son was premium. I had my son at 34 weeks. And I signed back into care to get that extra help because I, I'm, I'm a young single mother, so I, I needed the help. So I was like, you know, maybe if I sign back into care, they might actually care this time and, you know, help me and my son. So maybe it, it might change a little different since I have a plus one. So I remember my caseworker had defects came out. Like two days after I had my son to the hospital, and they was like, oh, hey, are, is your name Tiffany? I was like, yes. And I was scared at first because I'm like, who are you people? <laughs> so they came out, and I was like, oh, I'm Tiffany. And she's like, are you wanting to sign back in care? I was like, yes. So they went over paperwork with me. And they was like, okay, I'll, um, I'll return back to you when I hear anything. And I was like, okay. And the whole entire time, just being in the hospital for a month, and you just see your your bundle of joy just connected to wires. It it it, it broke me inside because it was like like still my case manager was not there to even see me. So when we went to the shelter at the time in the beginning of March. She came, she dropped my, my my belongings off, and 
made me sign papers to get him back into care. After that, she took off. She left in her car. And I'm like, what is I supposed to do now? And just staying there, and you just see different families, and then you just see yourself with your newborn child and another family. This it kind of broke my heart because it's like, what happened? Like I just had different thoughts of like, okay, what happened if I can only stay in this shelter for this much of time? Where is me and my baby supposed to go? Afterwards, where are we supposed to do next? It literally took <laughs> a month for me to even get into another placement after the shelter. And even being in the shelter, I just feel like it sucked. It, it made me hurt inside because I just wish I, I had the skills to be more more at a stable mindset in a, a stable position for me and my child. I I just wish things was differently. I wish I, I would have been, you know, had a house or a car, you know, more to offer for my child. But I just feel like being in a shelter and you just have your sick week year old newborn and, and they're with you, it, it feel bad because I'm like, I thought it's like, dang, like I'm a bad mother. I wish I would have I would have changed. I wish I, I could have did this. I, I don't like had thoughts like maybe I should run away from here or should I just stay put because I don't want to run away from the shelter and have nowhere to go. So I'm like, I, I just try to work it out. And then not even just that, being in the shelter, you kind of had to buy your own food. You don't buy your own food. You're, you're not eating. So. Thank God at the time I had WIC where I can supply my my son with formula and groceries for myself. But after that, you're still going to be hungry. And then it was hard enough being in the shelter and having lack of transportation. Being in the shelter because I'm... Like just having thoughts, like my mind's is, is racing, my thoughts racing. I'm, I feel like I'm losing it. So I'm like, how am I supposed to take my newborn to his doctor's appointments? How am I supposed to get back here to the shelter? How am I supposed to get back to the doctor's back and forth? It was hard. So like I had a couple times where, where one person from Defects reached out and took me. To my son's appointments, but after that time, when it was time to be like, okay, Tiffany, you know, you and your child are gonna have to go, and I'm like, we don't have nowhere else to go. So I'm like, like beg, I'm like, you know, can we just stay here a little longer? I'll, I'll try to get a job in the meantime to find a babysitter. I'll, I'll try to do anything, you know, just for us to stay here. And they was like, well, this is only temporary shelter. And I'm like. Okay, so I'll try to call my case manager. It was no no phone calls from her, no texts, no emails. It was it's like she went ghost on me. Like she disappeared. And in that time it, it was just it was depressing. And then having depression on top a uh, postpartum depression, it it was hard enough. It felt like my 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 heart was sinking. It felt like my heart was ripping into pieces. It felt like my my mind was going going crazy. It felt like I was losing myself. Like I I didn't feel normal. I I didn't know what to do. Timothy, you mentioned that you had some complications after delivery and an infection associated with leftover placenta, but you had to wait nearly six months to see an OBGYN, is that right? Yes. Dealing, dealing with that, I was, it made me feel like I had no rights as a human or even as a mother in the care 
of me and my child because my pregnancy, I, I had a rough pregnancy. And then with my son being premature, having him, at, having him at 34 weeks, and then me being sick in my pregnancy, I had lost 26 pounds in my pregnancy being sick. I was dealing with kidney problems. I was having kidney problems. They were trying to tell me that I might, I'm not, I'm not, cl I'm almost close enough to having kidney failure in pregnancy. I was at high risk of having high blood pressure and diabetes being pregnant. It was a lot. Having to have a lot of IVs connected to you, to have enough fluids for you to stay hydrated. It, it, I was, it was just, it was just, I just feel like a nightmare during the time. And then they was telling me the time that I had my son, I was losing a lot of blood. It was times that I didn't even eat because I was so sick. And they was talking about, oh, well, if you lose more blood than what you lose, then, you know, I might have to give you surgery to, you know, give you more blood. And I'm like... I'm like, this can't be true, like this, this can't be happening because, God forbid, what happened if I did have surgery and I didn't make it out the right way in surgery? Who's going to take care of my child? So like, I'll try to think like, no, we, we can't do that. I, I have to stay here for him because I'm his number one protector. I'm his num I'm, I'm, I'm his, I'm his savior. I'm his mother. I'm, I'm his, I'm his everything. I, I can't afford for you guys to do surgery on me, and I just had him, and I don't even know what was going to happen with us, so I, I can't afford that. And it was like, I, I understand, and I'm like, okay. So when they run a couple tests on me, everything came out okay. But they told me I had a kidney infection, so I had to get like a lot of medication. I was still sick. And then after losing 26, I lost, and I, I was like, I can't believe I lost 26 pounds. I, I was 154 pounds when I was pregnant. Before I even got pregnant, I used to weigh 123 pounds. From 123 pounds to 154 pounds, that's a lot of weight. And then closer to me having him, I was almost 200 pounds. So imagine all that weight, being sick, throwing up, you can barely move, you feel weak. And it's like you're trying to force yourself to eat because you're trying, you're trying to make sure that your your child has all the nutrients for them to grow and develop develop inside. And it's like you can't because you just feel so you feel gross. So, and then not even having that medical care or being you know treated with me being sick. And having to wait six months from my son being born, it, it made me feel. It made me feel less of, of a woman and as a mother because it, I had thoughts like, well, if I can't get the medical needs that I need, how I'm supposed to get my my child medical needs if I'm not get if I'm not receiving it. So I try to tell defects about it. I'm like, oh, okay, you you you. They say you've been seen, you've been checked out. I have not. And I used to bag these, like bag them, like I need to be checked. I have not been seen. I haven't been to a dentist in half a year. <laughs> and from the time of being 15 to now, I have got no, no help from you guys. And I got no help. I have no, I haven't got help when it comes to life skills, medical. Mentally, help, support, and, and skills. I have not got no help from it. From the time of 15 and 18 being in that care, I had to learn everything on my own. I had to teach myself. I had to go around and ask people, you know, how do you do this and this? How do you fill out a housing application? How do you fill out a job application? How do you do this and they do this? It was a lot. But I learned from people that I didn't even know. And it's like, I like told the facts one time, like, so what do what, I, what's my, what's my purpose even being in care? What's my person even, even working with you guys? Y'all not even helping me. What's the point? 
Well, you know you can just sign yourself out. So you give me an option of signing out, but you give me no options of the help and skills that I need. Mm. So I'm like, I thought about it and I was like, no, you know why I'm not going to sign out? Because people that went through the things I went through, we got so far where we needed to be, even without you guys' help. But one thing I will say to defects, y'all failed the system real bad. You failed the use of their caring, the support that they needed, especially knowing everything they went through, trauma, family background, situations where they needed help. And I'm just at the lack of guidance. Tiffany, thank you so much for sharing your story and your testimony with the subcommittee today. Uh, and the public and the Senate are grateful to you for speaking out about what you've been through. And I wish you and your baby son all the best. And we'll check up on you. Thank okay. You. Thank you. We will now take a moment and pause and bring our second panel to testify. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're reconvening now for panel two. And I will now introduce our witnesses. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we will hear this morning from Dr. Samantha Saul. Dr. Saul is the supervisor of the Child Sex Trafficking Recovery Services Team at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NICMIC. We'll hear from Deputy District Attorney Ernell Winfrey. Deputy District Attorney Ernell Winfrey oversees the Special Victims Division, Human Trafficking and Child Exploitation Unit at the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. And we'll hear from Brian Atkinson. Mr. Atkinson is staff attorney and adjunct instructor at the Wilbanks Child Endangerment and Sexual Exploitation or CEASE Clinic at the University of Georgia School of Law. Before opening statements, we'll swear in our witnesses. So if you'd all please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear by testimony you're about to give before of a subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. You may be seated. And uh, please note uh, for the record that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, Dr. Saul, you may now begin with your opening statement. Good morning, Senator Ossoff. My name is Dr. Samantha Saul, and I am honored to be here today on behalf of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NECMIC. 
For those of you who are less familiar with NCMEC, we are a private nonprofit organization that was created in 1984 by John and Revae Walsh after the tragic disappearance and murder of their six-year-old son, Adam. NCMEC has grown over the years to become the nation's largest and most influential child protection organization. NCMEC serves as a national clearinghouse and resource center to fulfill its congressionally authorized mission to help find missing children, reduce child sexual exploitation, and prevent future victimization. I have had the privilege of working directly with at-risk youth and survivors of child sex trafficking for the past decade as a forensic interviewer, an advocate, and a coordinator of a multidisciplinary response team. Within my current role at NCMEC, I supervise the Child Sex Trafficking Recovery Services Team, a team that was created specifically to address the topic of this hearing, the significant intersection between foster care, missing youth, and child sex trafficking. Thank you for hosting this hearing to raise awareness about this very important issue. In 2014, as you mentioned, the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act was passed. This law required child welfare agencies report children missing from foster care placements to NCMEC after reporting them missing to law enforcement. NCMEC is grateful for this legislation as it ensures that children missing from care and the child welfare professionals responsible for their well-being receive the resources available through NCMEC to support their location and recovery. Between 2018 and 2022, NCMEC received over 2,400 reports of children missing from care in Georgia, involving 1,790 children, many of whom went missing several times throughout the year. 410 of these children were identified as likely child sex trafficking victims. Trends show us that when children run away frequently or for long periods of time, they tend to be running from an unsafe situation or to an unsafe situation. As you heard from Tiffany this morning, children in foster care have already experienced significant trauma, which led to child welfare intervention. When children are then placed in foster homes or group homes that don't have the resources, training, or support necessary to meet their needs for love, belonging, and self-exploration, running away from their, these placements often becomes their effort to problem solve to meet these needs. This creates a perfect storm that traffickers are skilled at taking advantage of. We know we have an urgent issue when children feel better on the streets or with a trafficker than they do in their foster care placements. This is a national crisis that we must devote additional federal and state resources to address. My team at NCMEC has the important task of offering individualized coaching and support to foster care workers while children are missing to support them in meeting some of these needs. Every day we hear foster care workers express how overwhelmed they feel trying to navigate systems that are overstretched, under-resourced, and ill-equipped to meet the needs of the children that they serve. Child welfare agencies can play a crucial role in the prevention, intervention, and response to child sex trafficking. While significant legislative progress has uh, made a shift from a juvenile justice to a child welfare response to child sex trafficking, we now must ensure that child welfare systems have the support, the resources, and the practices necessary to meet the needs of our most vulnerable youth. Many states have developed innovative responses to attempt to address these issues. I would be remiss if I didn't highlight the state of Georgia as an innovative and proactive leader in the child sex trafficking response. NCMEC works closely with the Georgia Division of Family and Children's Services when children go missing from care, and I've personally participated in a monthly statewide call that is co-facilitated by Children's Health Care of Atlanta and Children's Advocacy Centers of Georgia that brings together key stakeholders, including law enforcement, child welfare, and victim service providers to increase coordination and information sharing. It truly takes a village and cross-system collaboration to meet the needs of youth. In closing, the issues of missing children from care and child sex trafficking are complex and multifaceted. Successful solutions cannot fall solely at the feet of a single agency. Like the hope that Tiffany expressed this morning, despite experiencing so much hardship, hope is what keeps us going at NCMEC. We hope that children in foster care will have the opportunities for healing, self-exploration, and caring relationships that we know all children so desperately need in order to thrive. But today we must move beyond hope and into action. NCMEC looks forward to linking arms and developing innovative, collaborative, and system-shifting solutions. Thank you for the opportunity to represent NCMEC at this hearing, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Saul. We will turn now to Ms. Winfrey and then uh, Mr. Atkinson. Ms. Winfrey. Just making sure your microphone is on and the red light is on. 
Okay. Good morning again. My name is Ernell Winfrey. I am the Deputy District Attorney and Lead Prosecutor for the Human Trafficking and Internet Child Exploitation Unit at the Office of the Fulton County District Attorney. I've been practicing law for 22 years, and for the last six years, I've been prosecuting human trafficking and sex abuse cases. And as a prosecutor and expert in this field, I have the privilege of serving as an advocate for survivors of commercial sexual exploitation by giving them a voice in the courtroom and by also holding their traffickers accountable. The views I express today are my personal ones. They should not be construed as a representation of the various statewide committees and multidisciplinary teams and task force in which I have the privilege to serve. In my work as a human trafficking prosecutor, I'm seeing about 80% to 90% of CSEC survivors we serve, they've been sexually abused and enter the life of commercial sex with this type of adverse childhood trauma, which increases their vulnerability of exploitation. Approximately 40% to 50% of the CSEC survivors we serve have either been in foster care or they have some sort of CPS history. Many C-sex survivors in foster care system present with complex trauma and with no real support to facilitate healing while in defects care. Sexual abuse causes feelings of shame, guilt, low self-esteem, low self-worth. And over time, the victims that we see, and they see themselves as damaged goods. Not addressing this complex trauma while in care increases their likelihood and entrance into the commercial sex trade or re-entry after recovery. And most of these children survive as merely bones, shells of their former selves. Several C-sex survivors I encounter report negative experiences while in foster care. Most express a lack of trust and faith in the system, as we heard from Ms. Tiffany this morning. Children in state care are far more vulnerable to trafficking than those with similar risk factors. Youth in foster care do not have ties to their biological families in many cases. It's hard for them to feel secure and to develop a sense of identity. When in care, routines change with each placement, and many have been susceptible to what we can call motel warehousing in the absence of qualified caregivers. At times, it can be inefficient, and at its worst time, it can aid in the exploitation of young children and feed them to the machine of forced labor and sex trafficking. We must dispel the youth, the myth, excuse me, the myth that human trafficking involves a stranger riding around in a white van, kidnapping children off the street and selling them into a life of sexual servitude. Most survivors were trafficked by someone they knew or someone even in their own family. Please understand that traffickers practice tactical warfare in creating victims, sometimes their weapons of choice are kind words or alleviating an immediate need. Many times those needs are for food, whether appropriate clothing, even sleep and drugs. Other times it's a sense of belonging and security and acceptance. A child with their hope and trust intact in a world with no support is ripe for the picking. They are deceived into a life of sexual servitude and it creates a world for them that they only know and understand while with the trafficker. Their casualty, and this casualty is always, and sometimes it's their innocence that's lost. It's their spirit that's lost. I had an occasion where, and we're seeing the trend, where there are inappropriate placements for CSEC youth. There was an example of young girls running away from a placement and finding themselves in the jaws of commercial exploitation. And when they were recovered, they disclosed the horrific experiences and heinous acts of violence committed against them while in the streets. It came to my attention that following their return from the being exploited, they were instructed not to sit on the furniture of the group home. They were made to leave their clothing on the outside. Sources close to this group home placement say the home was sorely lacking in quality food, personal care items, and cleaning supplies. In this home, enrichment activities were non-existent. Did the system fail them by not regularly investigating the placement that housed these young girls? Did the department ensure that the placement was proper for CSEC youth? Some of the children placed in care are labeled unruly, bad kids, recruiters, runaways, delinquent. Terror and sadness often wear the mask of anger and show up in various stages of acting out. If they're running away from care, what are they running from? 
We must take time to listen to their backstory. Why don't we train caregivers to look for and understand the trauma they suffered prior to entering into care? Can we get past the perception of foster youth as unwanted throwaways? How will we address the underlying trauma and the root causes so that these children may heal? If we are to be responsible for children in foster care, it is necessary to establish better safety measures and require placement to be trauma-informed and trained. The current protocol is not working like we thought it would, so it's time to reassess and not just investigate, but we must seal up the cracks that allow for further traumatization perpetuated by those in positions of authority and trust. Another example I had was a case with a CSEC youth that was recovered during an operation targeted at recovering missing kids. And when she was taken in for medical care, the detective noted that she was aware of her history in the foster care system as a habitual runaway. With this knowledge, they reached out to DFACS and requested that they take custody of her pursuant to Senate Bill 158. This CSEC youth had nowhere to go as she had been trafficked and had a history of past sexual abuse by a family member. DFACS did not send anyone to the medical facility, nor did they begin the process of exercising their authority under Senate Bill 158. In fact, because this child was known to be a runaway, the detective was advised to detain her and place her into a detention center. DFACS informed the detective they had no place for this CSEC youth to go. The detective informed them that she could not detain the CSEC youth because the youth did not do anything to warrant charges for placement into a detention center. Consequently, the detective, in collaboration with a federal agency partner, located an out-of-state placement for this child for her to go in and get immediate care and emotional support. Under these emergency circumstances, DFACS did not act in a timely manner, and the out-of-state placement was lost for this child. Shortly after being returned to her family, the CSEC youth ran away again, and she was exploited again. The question is, do we have a crisis, a crisis in housing? This is not to disparage caseworkers that work tirelessly in ensuring the safety of children in care. Caseworkers often do many interviews daily. They write report after report, respond to child abuse calls, and investigate claims. Caseworkers consistently whisper that they're lacking support. For example, caseworkers must get approval for decisions from equally overworked supervisors as opposed to a review team or a case reader. Can we restore this system in a way that's fair and place the needs and interests of our children in the forefront? Who will hear their voices and their cries? No child deserves to live in a life of exploitation. They do not deserve to be labeled with negative words like delinquent, recruiter, or the like if there is no evidence to substantiate it. Who will have the courage to say if it's broken, it's just broken. Let's do something to change it. We should include everyone in this solution, especially those in the health and human services. The department will not benefit from policies written for them by those who are not in the field. In my closing arguments to juries, I always say that it's their job to not look for doubt. It is to look and to seek and see the truth. It is my hope and prayer that through this investigation, the subcommittee will seek and see the truth and will be able to work through the problems to end the trends that I've spoken about. Again, thank you for this opportunity to share my experiences as a prosecutor in this field. And I hope and pray that we will have real answers to fix the system and make it opt, work at optimal performance. Thank you, Deputy District Attorney. Mr. Atkinson. Good morning, Chairman Ossoff. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Blackburn and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Brian Atkinson, and I'm the staff attorney for the Wilbanks Child Endangerment and Sexual Exploitation Center or clinic, also known as the CEASE Clinic at the University of Georgia School of Law. The views that I express today are my own and do not represent the University of Georgia or the other committees, teams, or task forces on which I have the privilege to serve. I am testifying today in my personal capacity as the lead attorney at the CEASE Clinic, an expert in sex crimes and trafficking against children, and an advocate for children in foster care who have been sexually abused, exploited, or trafficked. Last month, the subcommittee heard from the director of the CEASE Clinic, Emma Hetherington, and I'm here today to provide additional context and information based on my experience representing youth in foster care. As CEASE's staff attorney, I provide direct representation to survivors 
and supervise legal fellows and law students in representing child survivors in foster care dependency cases, adult survivors in civil litigation against their abusers, and survivors of trafficking in post-conviction relief cases who were convicted as a result of or while they were being trafficked. Prior to joining the CEASE Clinic, I was the Chief Assistant DA in Nor Georgia's Northern Judicial Circuit, where I prosecuted offenses including child sexual abuse. Uh, my responsibilities included serving on multidisciplinary teams uh, to discuss the investigation, prosecution, and response to instances of child abuse and maltreatment. I've had a first-hand view of how survivors are treated within various systems, as well as the barriers survivors can face in accessing justice. While CESA's child clients may at first appear dissimilar to the majority of children in foster care, the reality is that every child in foster care starts on the same path, and the final trajectory depends in large part on the state's response. Risk factors with the highest correlation to child trafficking include running away, homelessness, sexual abuse, a history of abuse or neglect, and entry into foster care. If a child's caregivers, families, friends, communities, and then the state fail to provide for their basic needs of food, shelter, safety, security, love, and belonging, their survival instincts kick in, and they seek out other ways to have those needs met heightening their risk of landing straight in the hands of traffickers, buyers, or of those who will exploit them. Since I have been at the CEASE Clinic, and as Dr. Saul noted, I have noticed a concerted effort in Georgia to update policies and practices to attempt to better respond to the realities of trafficked youth. However, these efforts are slow to be incorporated into everyday practice. Most significant is the movement to change the conversation so that these young people can be better identified as victims and survivors and treated as such, rather than criminalized and punished for their abuse and for their responses to that abuse. Regrettably, I've not seen a change in how that's impacting the day-to-day -day treatment of children. Specifically, I have observed progress in how we talk about the population as victims and survivors in saying that certain negative behaviors are likely trauma responses and agreeing that victims and survivors should be supported and not blamed for their victimization. But when that conversation shifts from talking about the population generally to discussing individual children, they're often labeled as at fault and are blamed for their victimization. Within the foster care system, this hinders efforts to secure appropriate placements for youth. The placement applications for my clients emphasize their flaws rather than their strengths. And that's the first piece of paper that a placement often receives, the first information they get about a child. So while DFAC says it's hard to, to find placements, it's harder still when they are painting incomplete pictures of these kids that accentuate their flaws, minimize their strengths, and paint a misleading picture who these children really are. It also informs how the placements will treat these kids because they never got a second chance or really even a first chance to make a first impression. That first impression was made for them. The portrayal of these children as being at fault or sharing the blame in their own abuse or exploitation also hinders their opportunity to seek justice. The state of Georgia has a robust network of child advocacy centers throughout the state that are available as tools for both defects and law enforcement to identify and respond to child abuse and maltreatment. However, when children are not seen as victims, they're less likely to be referred to those organizations when, that, when either they report abuse or when abuse is otherwise suspected. Not fully investigating those instances leaves both the foster care system and our communities less safe, and it denies those children the opportunity to seek justice. I've seen that when our clients reach out to DFACs to tell them about their experiences in placement, about feeling unsafe, about the need for therapeutic or other services, they're met with disbelief, dismissiveness, and often no response at all. At the end of the day, DFACs is the legal guardian for these children, and it is their responsibility to make sure that these kids are given spaces that are safe and comfortable. 
these children were removed from their families, which we know is a traumatic event, regardless of how a child is treated within that home. But we, that being the system, courts, defects, others involved, have collectively decided that the cost of removal is worth the benefit of being in the state's protective custody. But then these children aren't protected. We wouldn't and we don't put up with similar treatment of children by their parents. And we should hold ourselves, and especially the state, to a higher standard. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. And I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you all for your, your powerful testimony, your expertise, uh, and your service, each in your way, uh, to those most vulnerable kids uh, in Georgia and nationwide. Uh, Dr. Saul, I'd like to begin uh, by diving into some of the numbers and to ensure the public fully understands your methodology. In the testimony that you submitted, you described an analysis that Nick Mick performed at the request of the Human Rights Subcommittee, which found that since 2018, 410 children who were reported missing from the state's care in Georgia were likely trafficked, and that some of these children were assessed to have likely experienced trafficking multiple times, a total of 624 episodes of trafficking. We'll dig into exactly how you arrive at those numbers in a moment. First, let's just establish the baseline. Federal law requires foster care agencies to report missing children to NCMEC within 24 hours. Why is it so critical that children missing from foster care be reported to NCMEC as required by Congress? Absolutely. So we know that anytime a child goes missing, whether they are missing for a couple hours or days or weeks, they are not under the care and supervision um, of the agency that um, they are in the care of, and they are then vulnerable to experiencing any number of endangerments, including child sex trafficking. Uh, we have found that the longer a child is missing from care or the more frequent their missing episodes become, that risk increases exponentially. We, we've heard from multiple former foster youth through these hearings. We heard from Monet several weeks ago this morning. We heard from Tiffany about their experiences, for example, in group homes. In, in the written testimony that you submitted, you stated that children in foster care often run away because their placements are unable to meet their needs and that foster children who run away uh, and this is affirmed by uh, guidance from the Department of Health and Human Services at the federal level, are highly vulnerable to trafficking. Can you elaborate on how foster care placements may fail to meet the needs of a child and thereby increase their risk of running away and of trafficking? Absolutely. Uh, I do want to mention that any child, by nature of being a child, is vulnerable to experiencing child sex trafficking. Uh, but in the testimony that I've heard from my colleagues this morning, uh, we know that children who are in foster care are often entering the system after experiencing early childhood abuse and neglect, which we know can have a lasting impact on their brain development, on their self-perception, their self-worth, on the way that they interact with or engage with others, their ability to form trusting relationships. If they are then placed in placements where their needs for love and belonging and connection um, aren't met or placements that are not equipped to support them through uh, their trauma processing or trauma responses, we find that youth are often running away from those placements in an effect in order to meet those needs. Um, so we also see that sometimes placements might not have the uh, ability to create for children the normalcy uh, that other children might have. So the ability to engage in normal adolescent activities, uh, the ability to engage in self-exploration. So in figuring out who they are, what they enjoy, um, what they're good at. And so sometimes they're leaving out of a sense of boredom. Uh, sometimes it becomes a trauma response. Um, something might trigger them in a placement and if they haven't learned uh, coping strategies or they don't have, for example, a, a safe adult that they feel they can reach out to who, who will consistently pick up the phone to say, hey, something isn't working well for me here, running again becomes their effort to problem solve. Uh, and traffickers are uh, really skilled at identifying youth with those unmet needs. And they may come in and say, you're looking for love and belonging, I can provide that to you. Uh, for youth, you know, for example, who are LGBTQ+, and they're looking for acceptance, a trafficker will say, well, I accept you for who you are. 
Uh, traffickers are often creating this illusion of love, belonging, um, voice, and choice for youth, um, creating this promise that might lure a child out of their placement. Let's talk about uh, the numbers and, and the methodology a bit. First, what does it mean for a child to be reported missing from care? Um, so, like you mentioned, federal legislation in the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act and the Trafficking uh, Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2022 require that a child be reported immediately or within 24 hours to law enforcement and NCMEC. So, missing from care just means they have left their placement without the permission of their caregiver and their whereabouts are unknown. And how do you assess, how does NICMIC assess whether a child who has been reported missing from care is likely a victim of trafficking? So we screen every child who's reported missing to us for child sex trafficking. Um, as it's been mentioned, being missing from care is the number one endangerment for experiencing child sex trafficking. So at the time of intake, we are asking a number of screening questions to really look at the accumulation of risk factors or endangerments that that child may have already experienced. We know that the person reporting them missing might have a different definition of child sex trafficking. So instead of just asking if there are concerns, we're really looking at the, the whole picture that we're seeing. Uh, we also collect information while that child is missing from law enforcement, child welfare, other victim service providers. We have uh, incredible teams of analysts that are digging through social media that are trained at identifying the signs or indicators of child sex trafficking. And sometimes they might identify an online escort ad that's been posted of that child as well. In the testimony you submitted to the subcommittee, Dr. Saul, you noted, quote, it is a national crisis when children feel like being on the streets or with a trafficker is a better place for them than to be with their foster care placement. I couldn't agree more. I think you put it very well, and this is a national crisis. You also urged Congress to pursue legislation to improve protections for vulnerable children in foster care. In your opinion, what are the most impactful measures that Congress should consider to address this crisis? It's a great question. Um, I don't have all the answers. I can say there are some incredible people in child welfare, both on the front line and at the state level, uh, who work in this field every day, who um, really contribute to meaningful solutions. The one thing that I will share and what we have heard consistently from survivors of child sex trafficking, as well as what is clear in the research, is that the number one protective factor that can keep a child safe, that can prevent child sex trafficking or prevent re-victimization is relationships. Um, I don't know how you legislate that. Maybe, maybe you might, uh, but I think also as we heard from Tiffany um, and Monet in the previous hearing, that it was that person who came into their life, whether it was a CASA or a child welfare professional, who truly listened to them, who showed up for them, who fought for them, who drove five hours to visit them in their placement uh, that was able to turn their life around, right? And, a system, a child welfare system, I don't think it can ever be an adequate replacement for a parent, right? It's really the layers of people that are involved in that child's life, whether it's their CASA, their foster care worker, their attorney, um, nonprofit service providers, anyone else that comes into their life, a teacher at school, right, that can show up for them, believe in them consistently, that I think can make a difference. We know that the caseworkers that we talk to every day entered the field of child welfare out of a desire to be that person for the children that they serve. And we hear that they're then faced with policies, um, culture, expectations, lack of resources, so many systemic challenges that we've heard about through the hearings that ultimately prevent them from being that person for so many children. And I think you make a point that, that several panelists have made that as shocking as this crisis is, and as shocking as these numbers are, here in Georgia, by your analysis, hundreds of likely trafficking victims nationally, many thousands, we do have to acknowledge the hard work that caseworkers on those front lines are doing under very difficult circumstances and not fail to express our appreciation and our recognition of the difficulties under which these folks are doing a very difficult job. And by no means do I b interpret any of the testimony that you've offered today uh, as 
condemning those who are working hard often without enough uh, in order to try to save these children's lives and their futures. Uh, I would like to turn, uh, Ms. Winfrey, to your testimony. You, you raised concerns that survivors of sexual exploitation are being placed in group homes that are inappropriate for them. Can you elaborate on what makes those group homes inappropriate? Yes, and thank you. Group homes that house uh, youth, specifically children who've been trafficked. And I know I've said the acronym CSEC, which means uh, children, a, a child, excuse me, children who have been sexually exploited, basically, a CSEC. Um, those caregivers who are in group homes have to be trained with a trauma-centered focus. I think the issue becomes if we have a group home and you have children that are running away, why are they running away? And what we're finding is that the underlying trauma that those children enter that group home with, it's not being addressed. Is it being addressed because we don't have caregivers that have been fully trained with a trauma-centered focus and understanding of CSEC youth? And I think the issue becomes that we have to look at that. Handling children who are CSEC or who have been trafficked, you have to deal with them a little bit different. The risk factors for them are a little bit different. And I think that um, in my experience with kids who run, there's always an underlying issue. And what I'm seeing is that most of them have been sexually abused. And so if you're not dealing with that sexual abuse, them getting help with that and getting emotional support for that, it's, it's, it's like you're pouring a kerosene on a fire. It just makes it worse um, because that child is going to look for uh, a way to run or, or, or someone to love them or to be there for them or to understand them. And I think that group homes and that placement has to be appropriate. I mean, are we really looking into the background of these placements? Um, do they have adequate resources? They have tr people who are actually trained to work with the children that are CSEC. And I'm finding that, um, that that's a question that needs to be really looked into and answered. You mentioned a law known as SB 158 in your testimony. Can you explain what powers and responsibilities DFACS has under that state law? Yes. Uh, Senate Bill 158, um, codified in um, our code, talks about several things. It's one's to a hold, it's to hold people accountable for anyone involved with the trafficking of a kid or trafficking or exploitation of a child. Specifically as it relates to DFACs, DFACs can take emergency custody of a child who has been trafficked and they have seven days to do whatever cure they need to do without a court order. So um, it also requires that DFACs refer that child to trauma-informed placement, meaning they have to make sure that an organization that's assisting, that's assisting that child to heal, they are one, um, certified by the, just, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council of Georgia, and two, they are equipped to give trauma-informed care to that child. And so that's the responsibility of DFACs. They even have the obligation, if they have or suspect that a child has been trafficked or is actually trafficked, to remove a child from the situation um, and place them into uh, a better placement that where they have trauma-informed trauma -informed care. So uh, I think that that's a very important legislation because oftentimes, for us who are on the front lines of this, we see kids where we go in and have to recover through an undercover operation or such. And we need immediate help and need immediate assistance, meaning the department can step in, take custody of that child, and make sure that child is in a safe place where they're receiving trauma-informed care. And so without a court order. And we need that oftentimes. You testified about an incident Whereas I understand it, DFACs declined to exercise their authority under SB 158 of a child who had been trafficked, and that DFACs' failure to act quickly resulted in the loss of a placement that the detective involved in federal law enforcement then had to scramble to address, and that, as I understood your testimony correctly, that it was proposed that instead that child who was a victim of trafficking be placed in detention. Did I understand your testimony correctly? And can you just recap that case for us, please? Yes, and you did understand that. Um, we were actually involved in an operation, and this particular youth was recovered and was placed in a medical facility. At that time, 
she wanted to talk about what happened to her body. And what you learn in this area is that victims talk when they want to talk and when they're ready. And many times they're not ready to talk. But this particular youth was ready to talk. And we knew that we needed to get her into care. At that moment, um, detectives called DFACS, asked them to get involved, to send a caseworker to the hospital to ensure that the child would be cared for. They didn't send anyone. They actually said, well, she has a history of running away. We're looking at her CPS history as a history of running away, detain her, place her in a local detention center for you. That officer that I was working with said, I can't do that. I won't do that. That child has no reason to be placed into a detention center. She's done nothing to, to warrant charges. At that time, we were told, well, we don't have a place for her at this time. And when our detective worked with federal law enforcement partners to find housing, they actually located housing out of state, which we thought would be best for this particular youth because she did not need to be in the Atlanta area because that's where she had been exploited. We felt like her recovery would be better suited out of the state. And when we did that, um, there was a lot of calls back and forth of having to get approvals, go up the chain of command to try to get someone from the department to approve this movement. And as a result, time passed and we lost that placement out of state for this child. Where was this child during this time while you were working to In find a place? In so the so there was a, a child who had been a victim of sex trafficking who was hospitalized and DFAC's proposal was to place him in a juvenile detention facility for lack of placement. That's correct. You testified that the crisis in housing or lack of appropriate placements in foster care is a major issue. And I think we just heard a story about what that can mean in this case, a, a trafficking exploitation victim where it was proposed to place them in a detention facility. Please speak more broadly to what you're seeing in terms of the lack of adequate placements and housing and how that impacts particularly vulnerable youth, both those who have faced exploitation and trafficking and those who in the future, as we heard from Dr. Saul, may be at even higher risk because they are placed in an inadequate or improperly constructed situation. Sure. In the case that I was just talking about, the child involved in that case ran from placement. Okay? And they ran from their home because they were being molested in their home. The tragedy of that case is that because we had no placement, for this child, and we did not move in a fast enough pace to make sure this child was adequately placed, she's now placed back into a home where she was abused. And so now she is there for maybe not even a week, and now she runs again. And now she's involved again in sexual exploitation. She's trafficked again. So now you, you've not taken an opportunity because we don't have adequate placement. Again, after the initial hospitalization. Correct. So let me just make sure I understand this right. case. A child is trafficked and exploited, hospitalized. Because of inadequate placements, DFACS proposes to place the child in detention. The detective says we're not going to do that, seeks other placement. Because of the lack of available placement, an appropriate placement, this child winds up once again facing sexual exploitation? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Winfrey. Mr. Atkinson, you testified that children who survive sexual exploitation and trafficking often do not receive appropriate treatment or services from DFACS. What services do they, do they not receive uh, and how instead are they treated? Sure. I think uh, speaking Broadly, I think there's a tendency to define these children solely as CSEC and then providing services that flow from that uh, rather than ensure that survivors get services that are, that are specifically tailored to their individual needs, experiences, and desires. So not only are they receiving services that are recommended for them, like the, uh, the trauma therapy that, that Ms. Winfrey described as being necessary to process and, and, and confront and deal with and move past some of the underlying traumas, 
um, that these children um, have experienced and continue to affect them. Um, but they're not receiving services that they feel will benefit them or in ways that they feel will benefit them, leading to them potentially not engaging in any services that are offered, um, but not receiving the services that they want, not receiving the services that they feel would be beneficial in their recovery. Um, additionally, uh, we've heard from, as Tiffany described, um, the number of placement changes um, in her case. And um, at the rate placement disrupts for some of our clients, um, they don't receive any therapeutic services before they're moved to a new placement because of that disruption. And the referral process of trying to find services starts anew, creating substantial gaps in therapeutic treatment that is necessary for these children. Um, in addition, as we heard from Tiffany, I think that our clients um, have difficulty in general um, receiving gynecological care. Um, I think it's kind of illogical, like I said, that one area of need that all these CSEC youth, especially CSEC girls, um, do share that relates to their experiencing some level of sexual trauma um, is one that's not routinely provided to all survivors. A crucial issue that requires deeper inquiry. Fully agree with you, Mr. Atkinson. And I want to talk about education for a moment because Tiffany discussed how she was prevented from going to school while in a group home. Have you encountered other cases like that? What, what is driving this, this policy or this practice, at least at some group homes, of preventing children from accessing education? Yes, um, we have had clients placed in, in very restrictive placements where their educational needs were supposedly being met by programs administered by the placement. Um, however, by clients, um, when they do participate in some of those educational programming, aren't receiving um, credit for the schoolwork that they're doing at those placements because of issues transferring those credits to other school districts when they um, uh, re-enroll um, throughout the state, um, being enrolled in classes that they've already taken and already have credit for, um, or simply the programs that are being administered being unaccredited um, and them not being able to receive any educational credit. Um, I think it's well understood, um, like Tiffany said, that educational achievement is one of the biggest foundations uh, for success in adulthood. Um, so not only does that prevent children from graduating on time, uh, but many um, of these children get discouraged altogether um, and abandon their education even when they had initially and previously prioritized getting that high school diploma and pursuing post-secondary education. Mr. Atkinson, you mentioned uh, in your testimony you're a former prosecutor. From that perspective, have you observed issues with the way DFAX responds to disclosures or reports of abuse that can impede a child's opportunity to seek justice for sexual exploitation? Yes, um, it is frustrating. Um, to see situations that may be slipping through the cracks. Um, when children disclose uh, abuse or exploitation, whether that's, that's physical or sexual um, or something else, there needs to be an appropriate response to that disclosure. Um, like I said in my testimony, Georgia has a network of child advocacy centers um, around the state that are available in, as resources for both law enforcement and DFACs um, to utilize in assisting and responding to those disclosures. They allow for children to, to tell their story of abuse or neglect once to a trained interviewer who knows how to talk with children about those incidences in a way that, that minimizes the risk of re-traumatization and encourages full and complete disclosures. Those forensic interviews, or what they're called, often form the basis uh, for law enforcement investigations that can lead to the discovery of corroborating evidence, um, supporting witnesses, and sometimes additional victims. In a letter to the Georgia DFACS Commissioner, excuse me, the Georgia DFACS Director and DHS Commissioner, uh, Georgia's Office of a Child Advocate alleged systemic failures in how DFACS treated children who had faced sexual abuse. One of the issues they reported was that DFACS had allegedly adopted a view that children over a certain age could engage in quote, self-protection against abuse in their own homes. Have you experienced challenges in getting attention and care for your clients? And I want to remind everyone, again, we're talking about clients. Uh, these are children who are your clients. 
because of an attitude that they can self-protect or that above some age they can take care of themselves, even facing abuse like this? Yes. I think I have seen um, defects generally adopt the view that teenage children um, are in less need of protection because of the attitude that they can protect themselves. I've seen um, resistance to intervene in circumstances where a child or their, their parent or guardian aren't engaging in necessary or recommended services, um, which ultimately leaves those children less safe. That can lead to situations where more emergent and, and drastic intervention becomes necessary, um, potentially after additional victimization, when a less intrusive intervention could have prevented that if it had occurred sooner. You testified that DFACS has, quote, labeled children in ways that make it harder to find placements for them. Can you please explain the kinds of labels that you've seen DFACS use to describe children and how this complicates finding them placements in an environment where, as we've already discussed, adequate and appropriate placements, particularly for children with the greatest need, are so scarce? Yes. I've seen, um, specifically in the, the, the placement applications that I talked about when DFACS is looking for placement for children, um, my clients being described as, as promiscuous, um, as prostitutes, as placing themselves in dangerous situations, as children with sexual problems who are defiant, don't do what they're told, and leave without permission. These are on documents submitted by DFACS describing the children in their care in those terms. Yes, that's how defects is described. I thank all three of you for lending your experience and expertise to this hearing. Uh, Dr. Saul, thank you for the extraordinary work that you and the team at NICMEC do uh, to ensure that reports are made to help to uh, save and liberate children uh, who face trafficking and exploitation and all of your work here in Georgia at the national level. Uh, Mr. Atkinson, uh, thank you for your service, service both as a prosecutor and now with the CEASE Clinic and for sharing your experiences with us. Uh, and Deputy District Attorney, uh, grateful to you for your work pursuing justice uh, and for your candid testimony today. I am grateful to all who have attended and participated uh, today and uh, in our previous hearings. Uh, the uh, record for this hearing will remain open for two weeks. Uh, and I want to note that each of the witnesses today expressed a shared goal, which is improving the provision of care, protecting the most vulnerable children from abuse and from neglect, from human trafficking, sexual exploitation, assault, and degrading and inhumane conditions uh, in the placements that are supposed to be sanctuaries. Uh, and it is clearer than ever, based upon your testimony today, the urgency of continuing this effort to identify the urgent reforms at the federal level and in states across the country to protect the most vulnerable children. The hearing record will remain open for one week for statements to be submitted into the record. And questions for the record may be submitted by senators by 5 p.m. on Monday, November 13th, and the hearing is adjourned. <coughs>